Good morning. It's 11.20. Uh, welcome to the Elvik session at IETF 104. Uh, this is Mohit, and I have my co chair Zen Kao here with, with me. Uh, our AD Suresh is joining us remotely on Meet Echo, and we also have Eric in the room with us. So this is IETF meeting, and, and the note well applies. I hope by your by now you're familiar with the note well. If you have any questions, you can come to the mic. Hopefully not. Uh, so let's briefly go through what's the working group status since the last IETF in, in Bangkok. So we have the TCP constraint node networks draft, uh, which received quite good feedback uh, during the previous IETF. And the authors have submitted a new version, which we'll be now discussing today. And hopefully, it's now ready for a working group last call. Uh, we also have a presentation on the neighbor management policy draft from Rahul. Uh, there was an update to the virtual reassembly document, but there isn't any presentation planned. Uh, unless uh, you want to say something on the mic now. Uh, we will have a presentation from John on uh, security protocol comparisons document, and Rene will also present remotely the curve representations. Uh, he submitted a new version, so it's, I guess, at 03 now. We also have a few non working group documents that were updated. Uh, so Karsten Borman has this draft on uh, lightweight terminology document, and uh, Pascal also has a document on the security classes, which seem to be related. But we won't be discussing them in, in the meeting. If, if you want to review, please se send your comments on the mailing list. There was also discussion on the minimal ESP document, and we had issued a call for adoption. We received. Uh, quite a lot of feedback from Paul and, and Thero Kivinen. And I think uh, the chairs agree that there seems to be a reasonable consensus to adopt it as, as a working group document, no, knowing that uh, adopting doesn't mean the document is done and we will continue working on, on the document. Uh, there were no updates to uh, the co-op implementation guidance and this draft has expired. I don't know, Matthias or Olaf wants to to say something on on that. This is Matthias. So um, my main reason was there was no sufficient feedback on it. So we wrote a lot of stuff. We wrote and wrote and. It might be useful, but nobody came back to us and said, yeah, this is really good, or this is uh, still a question that I have. So that would be really nice to move forward with this. Yeah, Carsten Bormann, th this uh, document needs uh, some reshuffling with other uh, documents uh, happening in, in working and research groups. and. Uh, so I think we will see a new version when we understand how that reshuffling is going. Can the chairs help in some way to progress this? Occasionally ping the other chairs of the groups involved uh, to get this done. OK. Uh, last thing on, on the item was this uh, IETF Elvik cellular, which again is misref for the re because of the resource directory, but it seems that that is moving forward, so hopefully it would it would be published soon. Let soon enough. <laughs> so the resource Carson Borman says resource directory is in last call. Uh, by the way, I should have added that we have a Jabber scribe. Francesca is the Jabber scribe, and we have a note taker. GA is thankfully helping us with the notes. So this is our agenda for today. We'll begin with Carlos presenting the TCP usage guidance. Then we have Rahul on the neighbor management policy. Rene will remotely present the alternative elliptic curve representation document. And we end with uh, John on comparison of COP sec security protocols. Anyone wants to bash the agenda? If not, let's start.
Oops, sorry. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Carlos Gomez and I'm going to present the last update of the draft entitled TCP Usage Guidance in the Internet of Things. So first of all, let's take a look at the status of the document. The previous version of it, 04, was presented in Bangkok in both LWIG and TCPM working groups. And uh, we asked at the moment whether it was a, a good moment for a working group last call. And around those dates, we received quite a lot of feedback. Uh, for example, two full reviews, one by Yoshifumi Nishida, another one by Ilpo Jarvinen. Then we also received comments by David Black and Emmanuel Bacelli. And also, we received more recently the input of uh, code size measurements of TCP implementations for constraint devices by Rahul Jathab. So thank you very much to everyone for the feedback and all the inputs. And we produced version 05, trying to address all the comments that we received. And after the submission deadline, we received further feedback on version 04 by Stuart Cheshire. Um, basically, he made some suggestions. Uh, there were no significant issues, and later I'll present the suggestions. So let's go through the updates in this last revision. First, uh, we have the section on MSS, where we have first modified the ordering to start with the main recommendation, which is hopefully better for the reader. And we've also added that uh, a longer MSS uh, has the effect of reducing the number of packets for transferring larger payloads, which may be useful in some applications. Then the section on ECN uh, has also been updated. Now we have added explicitly that an advantage of ECN is that congestion can be signaled without incurring packet drops. And also we've added that an RTO may incur a wake-up action in contrast with a clock triggered sending. So this is relevant for devices that uh, have uh, energy constraints and apply techniques for energy savings based on uh, being in sleep mode for some times. Then section for the two, uh, here we have modified the title. Previously it was TCP guidance for small windows and buffers. Now uh, we have replaced small by single MSS, which is hopefully more accurate. And within this section, uh, we have updates in the part of delayed acknowledgments for single MSS stacks. First, we have a, an additional sentence, which is quite general, uh, meaning that the usefulness of delayed acknowledgments depends heavily on the usage scenario. And in the context of a single MSS sender that transmits to a receiver using delayed acknowledgments, we've also added that using senders using the Nagel algorithm may suffer similar delay issues as those produced by receivers using delayed acknowledgements. And we have also added that disabling Nagel has no impact in the case of stop and wait senders. Then there's the subsection 4 to 4, which uh, discusses the RTO algorithm for single MSS stacks. Here, the point was that uh, in this kind of stacks, the RTO algorithm may have a greater impact than on uh, greater window sizes. And here we have added a reference to a TCPM working group document, which discusses the RTO considerations, uh, all the uh, trade-offs and uh, requirements around the design of RTO algorithms. Then in the section 5.2, which discusses the number of concurrent connections, we have added something which is actually obvious, but was not written in the document, which is that we need to take into account the overhead of the three-way handshake of each additional TCP connection. So this is yet another reason why we may want to keep the number of concurrent connections in a constrained device low. And also we've updated the TCP connection uh, lifetime section here uh, regarding the text on TFO. We have added that TFO deviates from standard TCP semantics in the sense that the data in a SIM packet could be replayed to an application in some circumstances. Therefore, uh, applications should not use TFO unless this issue can be tolerated. 
also we have added the timely detection of a dead peer may allow memory savings, which may be useful for memory constrained devices. And then we've added another uh, sentence, which is quite obvious, but was not explicitly written, which is that sending TCP keep alive frequently drains power on energy constrained devices. Then we have updated also the security considerations. Basically, we have removed uh, the uh, reference to TCP MD5 signature option because it is no, no longer considered safe. And also we have updates in the annex which tries to collect the details, the details of some implementations of TCP for constrained devices. In the section that talks about micro IP, we now explain that if multiple connections are used, they need to share the same global buffer. And also in this section, we have added that uh, the TCP implementation in Contiki and G, that's the, the code size of the implementation, is 3.2 kilobyte on CC2538 platform. And uh, Rahul kindly performed these uh, measurements just for the sake of the document, so thank you very much. And the section about Riot has also been improved. We have now added that 32-bit platforms are also supported. There's also optional support for POSIX compliant sockets. And we've also added references to the main literature sources for both Riot and the TCP implementation in Riot. Then in the section about tiny OS, we have uh, clarified a bit a couple of sentences that were not so clear. And now we state, hoping it's clearer, that a send buffer is provided by the application. As the last update, well, we have modified also the summary table, which is in the annex. First, uh, we have changed how we express the content in the first row of the TCP features section of the table. Now we express it in terms of whether uh, an implementation, a TCP implementation for constrained devices is a single segment implementation or not. Then we have also added the last row, which is whether the platform, the, the operating system, uh, which is the reference one for each corresponding TCP implementation, has support for TLS or not. And also we have modified the, the number of the code size of uh, the TCP implementation for lightweight, lightweight IP 2.1. Formerly we had another value which was 40 kilobytes, but that was for a, an older version of lightweight IP. So again, Rahul performed uh, measurements and kindly provided this result, which is 38 kilobyte, which is uh, still aligned with the previous result, but it's based on, a, on an up-to-date version of lightweight IP. Well, after the submission deadline, there was a number of comments that we received from Stuart Cheshire on version 04. First, he suggested uh, adding some more text in the document about what are options 0, 1, and 2, rather than uh, referring the reader to looking for that in another document. Then about the recommendation of setting the MSS uh, not larger than 1,220 bytes, he suggested to explicitly state that there is an assumption here that is that the remote peer sends no TCP options aside from the MSS option in the scene packet. And he went further to explain that some platforms will include TCP timestamps, which in this case will add 12 bytes to the TCP header. And uh, perhaps it would be good to advertise an MSS not larger than 1200 bytes in order to accommodate for possible unrequested TCP options. And uh, another suggestion was uh, not recommending disabling delayed acknowledgements when we have request response traffic. And the idea here is to, uh, instead of having a response segment and uh, an acknowledgement segment as separate packets, having both combined into a single segment in order to, to get the benefits from this. So uh, our plan is incorporating the feedback by Stuart quite quickly, hopefully within this week, and release version 06. And pending that, the authors believe that the document is ready for working group last call. So uh, I would like to ask to the working group and the chairs whether that's actually something that can be confirmed. 
I'm Stuart Cheshire from Apple. I just want you to thank you for writing this. This is an enormously useful document as more and more companies get into making network products that have not been in that space before. Uh, there is this myth that is widely circulated that TCP is too complicated to implement. And I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it was true on 8-bit processors in the 1980s, but that myth persists and it leads to some very bad design decisions where people think that they can build their own protocol on UDP that's as good as TCP. And we've seen from the work done in Quick, you can build a protocol on UDP that's as good as TCP, but it's an enormous amount of work. And if you're new to networking and don't know anything about it, you're probably not going to do better than TCP. So using this document as a way of uh, bringing these people up to speed uh, and explaining some of their misunderstandings to them is really, really useful. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments and also for the suggestions for improving the document. Thank you. Thank you as well, Stuart, for reviewing this for your expertise. And so, uh, I think we will we will discuss this with the TCPM chairs after this meeting, and we will issue a joint la last call. My request is to those who have already commented on the document, including Professor Marco, Ilpo, Stuart. When we do issue a last call, please comment if you have any remaining issues or if you think the document is is ready, because that would help the shepherd to to move this forward. Uh, Marco, yes, I just would like to say one thing that I, I promised to send some comments earlier, but Ilpo's comments covered most of mine, so I, I didn't. So, but I have some additional few things, and I will do this uh, this week. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello, I'm Rahul Jadav. So I'll be talking about neighbor management policy. I won't be going into the details of this thing, but, but I'll just like to give an overview. So it comes into picture for constrained nodes which have limited in memory resources and the network density or the node density in the network is really, really high. So you have to manage the neighbor cache in an efficient way such that the churn in the neighbor cache is as little as possible such that your routing adjacencies are stable enough. So this directly impacts the overall latency that you can achieve for the applications and the packet delivery rates. So today what I'm going to uh, show is the performance data. We have an implementation in Conteki which is already mainstream, but it doesn't take into consideration some of the aspects of the draft. We have a private implementation. The data is based on this private implementation. Uh, uh, I'll talk about the data in the subsequent slides. So before go, go, going for the data, there are a few updates in, this, uh, in, in the draft. So there is something called as minimum priority, which is, which is, which is getting discussed in role, which is quite a useful figure, uh, quite, an informa quite, quite a bit of information based on which a node can decide which are the neighbors which might be prioritized. So we are making use of this information. It's a min priority like field. So right now, min priority is in the process of getting discussed in role, but it is not uh, it, it is not nowhere close to uh, fully uh, standardized. So 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 we have a similar field is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we have added more clarifications on route cleanup and its corresponding impact on the neighbor cache and how to handle it. Uh, and then we have added the performance results in the appendix. So the performance test, what we have done is we have integrated, we have used uh, LWIP as the network stack and we have integrated Ripple with it. What we have done is we have carved out the Ripple implementation of Conteki and made to work with it with Linux, LWIP, as well as micro IP. So uh, this is something that we talked about in NetDevConf as well this week, last week. Uh, uh, in this, we have, so LWL, LWIP is where we have added this neighbor management policy module, which takes into consideration how to, so, so whenever a neighbor cache entry is getting added, the reasoning for why is it getting added is also sent along 
and then a reservation based policy kicks in which decides whether this entry should be added or not if it is not added then a corresponding negative status is sent back depending upon from where the uh, neighbor cache is getting added for example if it is getting added in context to uh, ns na messaging then uh, uh, a, a negative acknowledgement in na is sent if it is getting in, uh, added in context to ripple messaging then a negative da uh, dao message is getting sent so we have used uh, the test tool white for framework which does realistic wireless simulation using ns3 in the back end uh, the test bit cont contained uh, 64 nodes and you can see that the density is quite high we have uh, packed in all the nodes in 80 cross 80 square meters we have used 802.15.4 and 2.4 gigahertz single single channel mode and slotted csma mode um, uh, the the data, the data transmission is uh, every 10 seconds every node sends a data every 10 seconds to the border router and the border router echoes the packet back and that is how we calculate the overall period so the it, 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 so we wanted to understand what should we what what is the data that we need to take pdr packet delivery rate we clearly understood you know it, 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 it this is something that we have got to measure so we wanted to check how how does the neighbor management policy impacts pdr but the network convergence time is difficult to quantify so how do you define network convergence time? Do you define network con convergence time when all the nodes in the network finally join the routing, uh, join the border router? Well, even if they join the border router, it doesn't mean that all the subsequent hops in between have still retained the entries. So there could be certain churn. So how do you define the neighbor, uh, network convergence time? So finally, network convergence time, what we decided what to do was the routing table should be stable enough for X amount of time. So that is how we uh defined and this this stability should be in the overall network not necessarily only on the border router. so uh you can see here what we have done is the neighbor cache size is 10 20 and 40 with without neighbor management policy and with neighbor man management policy we can see in single channel mode of operation we uh, we could achieve greater than 95 percent pdr even with extremely constrained neighbor table the important thing to note here is without neighbor management policy, there is absolutely no convergence. You cannot get any convergence with even 20 uh, neighbor cache size and uh, uh, table size. So it is quite a quite a big deal. Uh, the, the, this is what we had. We, we finally had to do this implementation to get our pilot working in the first place. We, we can see when the neighbor table size increases to 20, 40, uh, 40 almost the neighbor management with and without neighbor management, the performance remains same. There are some observations. Well, of course, with neighbor management policy, there's additional control overhead that is going to get incurred there uh, because of the proactive maintenance. So now the nodes in the network have to additionally signal some more information so as to make this proactive management possible. So that is the, that is the control overhead that we are talking of here. It increases uh, with neighbor management policy, and the convergence time is also high. If you see, as as compared to forty uh, neighbor cache size, the ten neighbor cache size, the convergence time is almost more than double. Uh, so it it also has an impact on the convergence time, and we feel that there are there are possibilities to improve on these numbers. Having said that. It would be we assume or we feel that this number th this work would keep have to be keep on rolling to improve such numbers you know we what we are trying to do here is put in a basic framework first such that we have some sort of uh, framework to work with in the first place without neighbor management the br could get all the routes but the neighbor table size was never enough and we could see that whenever a packet was getting dropped the packet was getting dropped because there was not a corresponding neighbor cache entry in the uh, in the in the in the neighbor table oh, well we we have been working on this for past two and a half years we have a pilot ready we the contiki implementation already has some form of uh, neighbor restriction policy based on this but but like i mentioned the contiki implementation doesn't consider it to, uh, doesn't consider the authentication phase wherein the neighbor cache might be populated because of the authentication signal or, or rather the pana signaling in pro progress so we, we there had been certain reviews from Mohit, from other people, and uh, based on the implementation, we have updated the document uh, in, in, in the previous uh, versions. We feel the document is ready because uh, we have practical experience of using this, uh, but it would be great to have more reviews. 
Thank you. Any questions? Mohit, so I was reading through the document again. I haven't read the latest version. I had read a previous version and sent in my comments. It At some point, it says min priority is set to some hex value. Could you like reference a document where? Yeah, yeah. so that is something that we added in, in, in the latest version. So we have referenced a document. Unfortunately, that document is a work in progress right now. It, it's fine that if uh, that it's not RFC or something, but like in the text, I didn't find the, the correct reference. Okay, okay. so in, I'll, I'll in, go back in, and check in, the text, the but that is. That, that would help. Uh, that's one feedback. Uh, then when you were showing the results, uh, there was this, the network is stable enough. So what, what like, what counts as stable enough? That, 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 so that, that is something that is, that we had to define ourselves. So like I mentioned, so the stable enough criteria is something that we defined. It has to be stable enough for at least few minutes. That's when we so call stable it enough st means that there is no change to the routing, routing table. table, right? There is no churn in the routing table. Like no entries are added, deleted, removed. Right, right. Okay. So saying this explicitly might help. Sure. Sure. I'll do that. I can add this in the, in the, in, in the performance results of the appendix section that I, I'll clarify this point. Any other comments? from the group. Do you think this is ready for working group last call? OK, I will send in a review of Thank this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Rene remotely. everyone. Uh, too bad I couldn't make it to uh, Prague, but uh, I think this also works. I have an update on this uh, alternative elliptic curve uh, representation draft. Rene, could you speak a little bit louder? Uh, sure. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I have an update on this uh, elliptic curve uh, representation draft. Background is on the next slide. Okay, can you put it on the whole screen? Oh, it is on the whole screen, okay. Yeah, so um, the background is uh, how to use uh, different elliptic curves that we used in applications, uh, uh, reusing uh, as much code as possible, and uh, also showing that uh, some of these uh, different animals that have been created by, uh, for example, the CFRG, are actually the same thing in disguise. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, what is in the current draft? The draft uh, contains lots of background material, so that's uh, all these uh, appendices. Right now I have uh, appendix A up to L. <laughs> um, but most of it is just to make the document self-contained. The uh, Weierstrass curve that is, uh, corresponds to this uh, curve 25519 and is also used in this uh, second signature scheme uh, at Edwards uh, 2551. Uh, is uh, the specification is only like uh, three lines. Um, what I did is uh, I added some uh, material on all the background material, including uh, how to do computations, how to uh, take so-called uh, square roots in uh, a finite field, how to make an, take an inverse, and I stopped in the back also lots of examples of uh, how to do uh, computations. Um, you could call those uh, test factors. And the test factors are designed to also show that, uh, for example, using the so-called Montgomery letter that is uh, specified in uh, some of the CFRG documents can be used to uh, really recover the whole uh, elliptic curve point, uh, which allows to use reuse uh, the signature scheme that's defined in one of these other uh, CFRG documents. So you can use a single implementation, uh, even if you don't care about wire stress curves and just about the CRG curves. Um, the detailed examples also provides for uh, a condensed, uh, compressed representation of uh, wire stress curves. 
what I also did in the last uh, revision, which I just posted in this weekend, is uh, I expanded a little bit on the security consideration sex, uh, section, uh, mainly to uh, uh, preclude reuse of uh, some of the keying material, which uh, directly exposes the, uh, uh, the private key and to warn against the kind of stupid combinations of uh, use of the private key with different schemes. And then um, I also expanded on the YANA consideration section uh, because uh, some people suggested I should ask for a code point. So that's what I did. Um, and I think the document is now in pretty good shape. Uh, I'm sure it is not your uh, average topic area, but uh, I think it could be useful for some of the applications that we're considering. Next slide, please. So I think the document is uh, is kind of ready. Um, I, of course, could give it another read, but more importantly is uh, to have other people look at it. So some uh, people have looked at it in the past. For example, uh, in earlier um, drafts, uh, Nicolas Reusner had a look at it. Then uh, I had some comments based on uh, email traffic by Philip uh, Helen Baker. And uh, Stanislav uh, had a very detailed review and I shared also all my uh, so-called Sage code with him to do redo all the computations and to check all the details. And uh, the last, the only remaining item is to check all the examples that I stuffed in the back. So it's about uh, probably eight pages or so but it's basically just numerical values um, out there. So that's what I have. Um, I don't know if other people uh, have had a look at the document or they have been avoiding it, but uh, um, I, I don't really know what further to add to it, um, but people should also at least look at uh, the security consideration and the YANA section, I think. Any Questions, comments? Going once. Well, I guess, uh, Rene, we wait for Stanislav. So I, I, I know that he provided already a thorough review. So once he has checked all the Sage routines, maybe he could send an email saying that he, he thinks the document is ready. If, if he sends that on, on the mailing list, then maybe we can have a early review from the security directorate and ship this because clearly n not many of us can understand the, the math behind this. And uh, I would I promise to review the security considerations and, and, and the INA text, but, but the rest is, I guess, Stanislav's domain and he will provide comments and then we see it from there. Okay, great. Yeah, so he told me that he would get back uh, before April 10, but probably even a week earlier. And he has been very responsive. Okay, that, that sounds good. So uh, we don't have to wait until the next IETF to, to progress this. You know, once we start getting uh, the go ahead from Stanislav, then we can do early sec day review and, and ship this on. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so my name is John Matson Ericsson. Uh, this is a presentation of an update of the comparison of co-op security protocols. Latest version, if is 0.3. Uh, and there's been two updates since the last ITF meeting. Uh, one update is that uh, the comparison has been updated based on updates to DTLS 1.3. Earlier version of DTLS 1.3 specified two different DTLS ciphertext structures. One uh, 
one uh, like in uh, DTLS 1.2 and one short um, surface deck structure. Uh, the latest version of DTLS 1.3 unifies this to a single structure. It's called DTLS ciphertext structure, but it is, has more in common with a short ciphertext structure. So they, they skip the large ciphertext structure. The ciphertext structure now is always quite compressed. Uh, then between 0 02 and 0 03, the main addition is that we have finally added message choices for key exchange protocols. And this has been the number one request since this was since the zero zero version here and also before when this was in core. And the uh, protocols we have added is TLS 103, DTLS 103, ad hoc. And <clears throat> then we have based on these new numbers for DTLS, we have reformulated some of the summaries for application layer protection of application layer data. And let's see. So the new table of contents looks like this. Uh, so basically all of this is new. We have a new overhead of key exchange protocol section, section number two. Overhead for protection application data is moved to section three. Uh, subsection for different protocols. And another change is that summary has now been moved as a first subsection. So in each, you get summary and then you get the details. <clears throat> so what are assumptions behind these, the numbers in this draft? They are based on trying to minimize as much as possible. Uh, minimize number of algorithms and cipher suits. Uh, these are the cipher suits. Length of key identifiers, one byte. Length of connection identifiers, one byte. DTLS RPK, we have uh, chosen to do with point compression. Uh, I think point compression is not really implemented anywhere for this, as I have heard, but we chose to go with the, uh, the choice to do the the smallest size that is standardized to do a fair comparison. Uh, there's only mandatory TLS, DTLS extensions, except for connection ID. We feel that connection ID is a very important use case for LVIG deployments. And it also makes comparison with ad hoc better. Uh, and there's no DTLS fragmentation. That would add more. Uh, the structure of the documents is that it is similar to the protection application data. There's quite a lot of information. And uh, <clears throat> we have noticed that this is requested by people reading this. It also gives give credibility to the numbers. You can verify them and you can see why the numbers are like they are. So you can compare. Uh, this is how the document looks for DTLS. You list the record layer, handshake layer, and then all the different fields in the handshake header and then extensions. And then it continues like that. Uh, this is how the RPK in TLS looks like in ASN uh, 1. And this was borrowed from a master thesis at Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Uh, and this how, is how the format looks for the ad hoc messages. Here's a Seaboard sequence, and here are Seaboard diagnostic notation. And this is just a subset of all the information. Uh, there are two main tables in this comparison. Here's the first, this is DTLS 103 and TLS 103. And this is without connection ID, so only the mandatory extensions, minimal uh, amount to do this. And the extensions depend on if you do PSK or if you do RPK. And we have compared RPK and PSK. You could compare certificates also, but then the sizes depends very heavily on the certificates. So we have not 
done that, at least not yet. Uh, so as you can see, the DTLS and TLS, I don't know how this compared to early version of TLS and DTLS. Uh, that might be something to add in the future. Uh, <clears throat> actually, there has already been a uh, request for that, a university that contacted me and asked if I had numbers for that. Uh, <clears throat> main difference between TLS and DTLS is that DTLS add sequence numbers, it adds, uh, what does it add more? It adds some structure for fragmentation. So, but basically it's the TLS numbers and you have some additional header fields. Uh, and here is RPK with elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, PSK with elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and PSK without perfect forward secrecy. Uh, next table compares DTLS with ad hoc, and here is the comparison is the same. Same numbers for DTLS, ad hoc with RPK and ECDSA, ad hoc with PS, PSK and ECDSE. Uh, and as you can see, the numbers for ad hoc are drastically smaller. Uh, we also done uh, uh, checking what you get if you have a cached certificate. So this is a combination where you have a cached certificate. This client has cached a server certificate and used the cached information extension. Uh, this client still sends its uh, RPK. And you get a little bit, that actually leads to a little bit more information sent because the cached is a quite big hash, but you get a little bit different distribution. Um, and the question to the working group is what's next? What the, how would the working group first what does the working group thinks about the changes that was made is it structured in the correct way would the working group like it structured in some other way some other comparisons in the table and so on uh, and also right now we are comparing the byte sizes of the protocols themselves is there any other is there any other deployment scenarios that should be considered, any extensions that are important for LVIG use cases? Uh, and what would the working group like to be added in future versions, if anything? Can also, I think there's a lot that could be added. We need to decide on what should be added. We cannot add everything, then the draft will never be done. Uh, Yes. There's a comment from Ranit. Yes, right. Should I press the... Okay. Um, I think this is a great document. Um, I have uh, two two questions, I think, or maybe three. But uh, um, so one of them is I saw, I noticed in the TLS working group, uh, Eric Roskela had this uh, draft is about compressed TLS. So maybe it would be good to add that to the comparison list. Just to show how low you can go compared to what he came up with. Yeah. Um, That's a good suggestion. I have listed. There is actually two different compressed TLS drafts recently submitted to ITF. It's uh, Compact TLS 1.3 or CTLS submitted by Eric Rescola to the TLS working group. And there's TLS handshake in CBOR or TLS C. Uh, submitted by Jim Shad to the ACE working group. And these are definitely potential uh, additions in the future. I, I would, but I would, in that case, wait a couple of me meetings to get them some stability before adding them. So we don't of have course. to uh, do changes every meeting. Yeah, so the the other question on the document itself is uh, you had some comparisons with uh, raw public key. And that always raises the questions, uh, how do we know those keys are authentic? So, um, and I haven't really checked uh, right now, uh, uh, but 
did you also provide a figure where um, you had, uh, let's say, one search and, and, and what the comparison is then? I didn't hear you. The answer to the first question is that how you find out that it's authentic, authenticated or, or authentic or not is probably not uh, for this draft to answer. Your second comment, I didn't uh, understand. Oh, what did you? Yeah, yeah. So the it's it's not so much the the security side of things, but it's it's just the message size comparison. What happens if you add a certif certificate to the flows, right? Yeah, okay, if you do certificate. I don't have a simple answer, but I think the numbers would likely be, I, we could add that it's probably quite easy to calculate from the RP key numbers. You need to um, remove the RPK size here, 59, and then instead you add uh, size of the certificate chain that you're sending. That we could definitely do to the next version if you think that's good. Yeah, yeah, and 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 maybe it's it's not really necessary, but it could have an implication on some discussions on uh, whether you can squeeze something in, let's say, if the sixty octet uh, uh, yeah. packet, right? because then yes. suddenly it overflows, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the final comment I have is uh, I noticed in the security consideration section you you said this document is really informational. It, it may be good to uh, state whether the co protocols that you compare have the same security properties or, uh, you know, at least from a, you know, practitioner's point of view, or whether they have different tenets, for example, with respect to, uh, you know, denial of service or things like that, right? Could be just a one-liner, right? If the, the security protocols are, uh, are presumed to have the same security properties from a practical perspective. You don't um, want to stop the document with 50 pages with security analysis, that's for sure, right? I, I don't, I, I would, yeah. I, I, you want some more description about differences between the protocols. Do I understand you? I, I, I think the main point of the document is to show how that you can really uh, squeeze sizes down a lot, which I think it has lots of value. Yeah. Um, when I looked at some of the protocols, uh, I was also considering like, are there any things that you potentially lose, or are you comparing apples to apples, for example, right? Yeah. So, uh, I, so, in, in, so there you could uh, you could just refer to the documents themselves, but you could yeah. add a, a small one-liner that uh, that states your uh, your perception of whether they. Yeah, are I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah some short inf they're probably i think the comparison is, is quite close to comparing I, I don't know it depends tls it's on a much lower layer than for example oscor in the old section uh, so it's for the key exchange i think it's more similar I, I will think about what to say i think it's a good idea so people don't think it's they have slightly different use cases yeah a different problem yeah but not too much hi francesca uh Rene, co-author of, of this document i just wanted to point out that in the conclusion subsection uh of the draft we do start some of this consideration about um um things that impact uh, these message sizes and it's not it's a first draft it's, it's not complete we can probably do better but that was some of it is in in there. Yeah, so it's just a suggestion, but it's it's great mm. so far. I think it's a good comment. Thanks. So, coming back to now, we already um, Renee's comments um, was on what to add in future versions. So, as I said, what I could find what could be reasonable to add is older version of TLS and DTLS. Uh, one or two and one detail is one or two. This has, I already have seen requests of doing this. Uh, would be very happy to see what the working group, does the working group want that? It's reasonable amount of, of work or do we want to focus on new things? 
Mohit, uh, I think that that would definitely make sense to have numbers for older versions. I also wanted to comment on on uh, what Rene was saying earlier, and and uh, perhaps there is text on on the conclusion. So uh, I was reading reading through the document and things like DTLS 1.2 has explicit sequence numbers and so on, which which causes this overhead. I think that is perhaps the most valuable information I get from the document. So if I just see numbers, okay, I get some information that yeah. this is more lightweight than the other, but I think the most useful information is why is yeah. something better than, than the other. So perhaps yeah. having more text like that yeah. and perhaps even in the main body and not just in the conclusion would, yeah. would be useful. That's a good comment. I think that's, that's definitely missing from the key exchange part and probably from the protection of application data as well. Yeah. Uh, then, as Rene said, the second option is to add these new compressed TLS handshakes. I think for that, I would wait until they are a little bit more stable. It was painful enough to add DTLS 1.3 when it was a draft because it changed uh, basically every ITF meeting. Um, but I think that's very useful to do in the future. Uh, second thing is application layer, TLS, if there's something that, that should be added. Um, TLS certificate compression is something that is done and could be added. I would suggest to not go into certificates. That's, uh, that's a whole new... <laughs> new thing, uh, unless the working group very strongly believes that this should compare sizes of certificates also. And the last thing that makes sense to add is group Oscoria actually already added a sec empty section for that, and that's planned for the next version. Uh, so I think this document will explore if we, like at some point we draw the line and say, this is what we include and this is what we don't. Yes. So I think client server and that's it. We don't do group communication. We don't do all the other things. So okay. as an individual contributor, I think my, my recommendation would be not to have group because that's one way of limiting what we will have in the document and what we want. And seems reasonable to have client server and then the rest can be in another document. I think just getting the numbers for these and making sure those specs themselves are stable enough, this document will take quite some time. Yeah. Uh, the other question or comment was about this certificate compression. I understand the challenge because how many CAs you have and how many sub CAs you have and so on. And uh, I don't, I don't know, but either way is fine. You could add it or you, you could leave it out. It, yeah, it's much harder to get some, if you take a look at TLS, what's the minimum amount of information you can send? It's much easier than to try to reason what is the minimum. What is the information in the certificate that makes sense to have here? So, that's true. Okay, well, that's a good, seems like the working group thinks these things should be added on the left side here, yeah, what's I'm hearing, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, from working group chair, I have a very general question about these drafts. So because these are basically very good in size of the uh, overhead of each uh, security protocol, but uh, have, have the protocol designers, uh, for example, OS Code, has taken any uh, recommendation from uh, this inside in designing their security protocols? Is there good examples here? Uh, yes, I think so. I think uh, I think now Oscor is not here, but I think to actually start comparing this was a big, uh, big push for Oscor to get leaner. I think it was also a very big push for DTLS to get leaner. The DTLS 1.3 record layer, which went from I think 26 bytes in DTLS 1.2 to 11 bytes in DTLS 1.3. And I think now we are seeing the same things. Just publishing paper, things from this makes peop, makes the author think what can we optimize more. So ad hoc, since this first um, 
No, it has not. Been, but ad hoc has been optimized quite a lot recent meetings, and now we're seeing very much optimization of the TLS product. So I think having this, these numbers and this discussion is definitely one factor why this is happening. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I guess we are done for today, unless somebody has some. Okay, well, you save five minutes. Have a good lunch. Uh, blue sheet, blue sheet.